Amen. Well, the first enemy of the heart that we're going to look at is found in the nation of Ammon, in the nation of Ammon. And we find that in Ezekiel 25, and we're going to begin with verse 1. We read this, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, Because you said, Aha! against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Indeed, therefore, I will deliver you as a possession to the men of the east, and they shall set their encampments among you and make your dwellings among you. They shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. And so what was Ammon guilty of? What was the thing that they did that offended the Lord? Well, they were guilty of having an unloving heart, of having an unloving heart. And I want you to notice what it says here in verse 3. It says here that because you said, aha, against my sanctuary, because you said, aha, when it was profaned, against the land of Israel, when it was desolate, against the house of Judah, when they went into captivity. Therefore, I will deliver you as a possession to the men of the east. Now, it helps for us to have a little bit of history to understand what's going on. The Ammonites were the descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. That's who they were. And you know the story, Lot settled in the city of Sodom, and before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot escaped and fled to the hill country on the southern end of the Dead Sea. And some of you have been to the southern end of the Dead Sea. Probably thinking that they were the only people left on earth, Lot's daughters got him drunk, and they had an incestuous relationship with him. And the older daughter gave birth to Moab, and the younger daughter gave birth to Ben-Ami. And the Ammonites were the descendants of Ben-Ami. So they were related to the Israelites. And so when Israel entered the promised land, God instructed them not to harass or contend with the Ammonites. However, under Saul's leadership, Israel defeated the Ammonites, and they were a conquered people. In fact, David continued ruling over them and later conquered the capital city of the Ammonites. And so after Israel and Judah divided, the Ammonites began to ally themselves with the enemies of Israel. So they had a long-standing history of hatred that was building between them. You know, resentment uh, because Israel had conquered them, and the Lord told them to leave them alone. And their intense hatred caused them to dehumanize or to demonize Israel. That's what that hatred did. They were looking for any reason to come against them and go, Aha! Aha! Have you had those people in, in your life? You know, those that they're, they're just looking for you to mess up so they can go, aha, I caught you doing it. Usually, they're our mother-in-laws. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I love my mother-in-law. And then when bad things happen to them, you know, they rejoice. See, I knew it. They had it coming. You deserved it. I was just waiting for it. They were watching and waiting for Israel to fail. And when they failed, they were looking to benefit from their failure. They weren't just looking for them to fail. They were wanting to get the goods. They were wanting to benefit from that failure. But the reality is, is that Israel and Ammon were family. They were family. They were together. You know, and here's the thing. Once you dehumanize someone, once you demonize someone, you can justify the unloving ways that you treat them. Isn't that true? Once you look at someone and you determine in your heart that they're less than a person to you, then you can do anything to them and you feel justified in it. You can yell at them. 
You can slander them. You can talk behind their backs. You can, uh, you can even just talk bad in front of their face. You know, you can attack them and you feel okay doing it because you don't see them as a brother or a sister in Christ or you don't see them as another human being that is on their journey, whether they're going to heaven or hell. You just see them as an enemy. You see them as less than human. And once you come to that place, you can justify in your heart any way that you treat them But God says as believers that we're not to live like that. As followers of Jesus, we are to live differently. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. You know, that person that... You're just hoping that they're going to get theirs in the end, and all of a sudden, they start to get it, and you, inside your heart, you're like, oh, praise God, that's so awesome. He's finally getting his, and then God says, now, wait a minute, I'm going to bless him instead. And you're like, what? It's going in the wrong direction. He's supposed to get it. But you see, God looks at our hearts, and he says, if that's how you're going to be to them, I'm going to bless them. That's what that means there in Proverbs. The prophet Obadiah Obadiah wrote in Obadiah 12, But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord upon all nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. In fact, Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 9, that we are not to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And he goes on to say, uh, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. You know, as a believer, I don't rejoice when my brother falls. I don't rejoice. I don't rejoice when my brother fails. Even if I think they had it coming, even if I felt like they were on a certain path, when it happens, I don't rejoice in that. If there's anything I'm going to rejoice in, I'm going to be rejoicing in, in if they turn around and they return to the Lord. And they give their life and surrender back to Jesus Christ. That's cause for me to rejoice. But when my brother falls, I don't rejoice in that. That's how we are to live as believers. Because God calls that an unloving heart. God calls that an unloving heart. Maybe you're here and you're the recipient of an unloving heart. And maybe that's been something that has touched your life in a negative way and God wants you to sense his love tonight. Maybe you're in a place where you have an unloving heart. And the Lord wants to see it, have you see it in the proper light that he's forgiven you of so much. That his life is in you. He has given you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And we as believers are called to extend that same mercy that we have received to one another, especially those in the household of faith, those that we call our brothers. You know, I've been, I went through a, a, a time in my life when, you know, when I felt attacked by my own brother and, and I had to constantly remind myself, no, that is not my enemy, that's my brother. My brother is not my enemy. My brother is my brother. And that's the reality for you and for me. Our enemy is not our brother. Our brother is our brother. And we should always keep that distinction. The second enemy of the heart is found in the second nation we're going to talk about tonight. And that is the nation of Moab. In verse 8 of chapter 25, it says, Thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Seir say, Look. The house of Judah is like all the nations. Therefore, behold, I will clear the territory of Moab of cities, 
of the cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth Jeshemosh, Baal, Meon, and Kir, uh, uh, that word. <laughs> that city right there. K-Town. Now, notice what he says here. Because they said, look, the house of Judah is like all nations. What were they saying? Really, it was a slam against God. That's what they were saying. It was a slam against God. They were essentially saying that God doesn't exist. That there's nothing special about Judah. They're just like everyone else. And what they were guilty of is having an unbelieving heart of having an unbelieving heart. As I said earlier, the, the Moabites were descendants of Lot, right? They were uh, the descendants of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his oldest daughter. And the Moabites lived in the Transjordan Valley south of the Ammonites. And so you have the Ammonites and the, the uh, Moabites were south of the Ammonites. And when Israel traveled to the Promised Land, they did not pass through Moab, uh, but they were through the wilderness. They went through the wilderness to the east of Moab. So they were on the border of the nation on their way into the promised land. And the king of the Moabites was Balak. And as Balak you know, heard how Israel had defeated the Amorites and he now saw them on his borders, he was scared. He was afraid that they were going to come and attack him. And so he sought the help of Balaam. Balaam was a, a prophet, uh, a pagan prophet. And he told Balaam, I want you to curse Israel so that I can defeat them and drive them away from our land. That's what he wanted to do. He just wanted to get them out, uh, uh, you know, get some safe distance between him and the Israelites. He was afraid of them. And so Balaam tries to curse Israel four times. Four times he tries to do it. But God wouldn't let Balaam curse Israel. Every time he set to curse Israel, he ended up blessing Israel. It wasn't going in his direction. And so he comes back to Balak and, you know, Balak goes, listen, I've told you to, to curse them. And every time I, I tell you to curse them, you end up blessing them. That's not what I'm paying you for. You know, I want you to curse them. And he says, listen, every time I try to curse them, God won't let me. He tells me to bless them. But he goes, I have a plan. And this is what the plan is. This is what you should do. So Balaam tells Balak, I want you to take all the, the good-looking daughters of Moab, and I want you to send them to the Israelites, and I want you to use them to tempt the men of Israel into worshiping Baal. And if you do that, and they begin to worship Baal, God will destroy them. And Balak goes, that's a good plan. So he put it into action. And here's the thing. It worked. They sent the daughters of Moab in. And all the young Israeli men were tempted by the daughters of Moab. And they fell. And they worshipped Baal. And they gave in to that. But here's the thing. In the heart of the Moabites, it formed an opinion about the Israelites. It says, you know what? You guys are all the same. You're like, just like everyone else. There's nothing different about you. There's nothing special about you. We don't believe God is with you. In fact, we don't even believe in God now because you're just like every other guy. All you guys want one thing. Food. I mean, sorry. <laughs> guys want two things. Food and sports. You're just like all the rest. There's nothing special or unique about you. You see, the world doesn't acknowledge the presence of God that lives in you. The world is going to look at you and it's going to look for reasons to doubt the existence of God. And for most of the world, you're the only Bible they're ever going to read. Your life is the only Bible that they're, only, that they're ever going to pick up. And they're going to look at your life and they're going to make a determination whether God is real or not based on how you live your life as a believer. 
And just like the Moabites, their heart is filled with unbelief. They don't believe that the Spirit of God dwells within us. When Christians go through difficult times, they'll often mock the Christians. Where's your God now? Who's going to deliver you now? Who's with you now? Or they'll say things like, you know, I prayed once. Didn't work. God isn't real. There's no faith. There's no belief. The hardest one is when you stumble or fall and the enemy sends someone into your path to say, you're not God's special person. You're just like everyone else. You struggle just like everyone else does. There's no help for you. It doesn't work. And one of the problems that we've seen in the American church is that we've accepted a form of religion. We've accepted a form of church that doesn't expect to experience the presence of God. We've accepted that as normal. And so oftentimes as I go different places, you'll see people come in and out of church and they don't expect to have any encounter with God whatsoever. They're just fulfilling an obligation. We have a form of godliness, but we've denied its power. And so we come to church with no expectation of hearing God's voice. In fact, we're surprised when God speaks. But it should be the norm. It should be the norm. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And in John 16, 13, we read, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you things. And unfortunately, many pastors don't teach their people to hear the voice of God because they've never heard heard, uh, God speak themselves. And so you can't lead people into things that you haven't yourself experienced, that you're not walking in. But I believe that as a people of God, that we are a special people, that we are unique, that the presence of God lives inside of us, that God himself speaks to us, that Jesus is alive, and that his, he has a voice, and his voice can be heard by his people. His sheep hear his voice. And I believe that every person here in this room can hear and know the voice of Jesus, leading you and directing you. We're a people of the presence of God, And our God is alive, and he's not deaf, and he's not dumb, but he speaks. He makes his thoughts and intents known to us, and of course, the primary way he makes himself known to us is in his word. He's given us his word as his love letter to us to speak to us. And I praise God for this church here, Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, because you have a pastor who knows the voice of Jesus and who teaches you his word and teaches you to know the voice of Jesus in your own life. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And we need to learn to trust and believe God's word and to have believing hearts that are ready to hear and ready to obey. And so when you come on Sunday night, when you come on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights or whenever you come for anything, you come with an expectation because God is in this place and he is going to speak to you. And he has great things for you. You come and worship the living God, not just to sing a few songs, hopefully in key, but not not just to sing a few songs, but you're speaking directly to Jesus himself and declaring your love for him. You see, we have an expectation that we are going to encounter the living God. Something that, I've been experiencing that I've been practicing is everywhere I go, I'm asking God just a simple question. What am I here for, Lord? Why did you send me here? I believe that God sends us everywhere we go. 
that when I go to an appointment with someone, when I'm going to meet someone, or even if I'm just going to the grocery store, I begin asking the Lord, Lord, why am I really here? Do you have something for me? Is there someone that you want me to speak to you? And I'm taking steps of faith to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit as he leads me. And let me just say that it's never convenient when the Holy Spirit leads you. Oftentimes it's, it's really inconvenient. It doesn't fit my schedule. You know, the, uh, a few weeks ago, my son uh, brought a girl home uh, who he had rescued um, from the beach. She had been beaten and raped. She was homeless and uh, brought her, you know, to our house. And, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, Dad, we got to help this girl. And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm a busy guy. I've got a schedule I got to keep. I've got a lot I've got to accomplish today. And, you know, and I don't know this girl, and I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I don't know if, you know, and, and in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm remembering, you know, one day I said to Jesus, my whole life is yours, right? But, like, but today it's like, but, but my whole life is yours as long as it fits within my schedule. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, help the girl. Just help the girl. And it was like, oh, really, Lord? Do you know how busy I am? You ever told the Lord that? It doesn't ever go well when you have that kind of a conversation with the Lord. He's like, really? Help the girl. And so we took most of our day and we, we helped this girl get into a, a women's homeless shelter and, and, and the Lord took care of her. You know, but that was, the, that was like my first thing. Lord, okay, I want, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit, Lord. I want to give you my time. I want to give you my day. You, you take and use me how you see fit. You direct my steps. And as I began to do that, he began to direct my steps. And it wasn't convenient. And here's the thing. When you begin to surrender your schedule to the Lord, when you begin to surrender everything you have to the Lord, your time, your day, and you allow him to lead you by his Holy Spirit. It may not be convenient. It may not fit into your schedule, but I guarantee you it will be exciting. And at the end of the day, as I was, you know, we, when we first met this girl, she was down, she was depressed, and then when we left her, she was smiles, giggling, and she was saying, I want to go to your church. That's a great church. I mean, what church, what church are you a part of? She was Catholic. I want to go to your church. That's the kind of church I want to go to. And I was driving away and I was weeping. Because you know what? I want to go to that church too. Don't you? Isn't that the kind of church you would want to go to? The kind of church that is willing to set aside their schedule to follow Jesus and do whatever he tells them to do. Praise God that this is that kind of church here. Amen? Amen. 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 The third enemy of the heart is found in the nation of Edom. In verse 12 we read, Thus says the Lord God, Because of what Edom did against the house of Judah, by taking vengeance and has greatly offended by avenging itself on them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom, cut off man and beast from it, and make it desolate from Taman. Dedan shall fall by the sword. Now, the Edomites were descendants of Esau. And you know the story of Esau. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a what? A bowl of stew, right? So he sold his birthright. And when he went to get his blessing from his father, Jacob had already taken it, and Esau never forgave Jacob for doing that. So there's been a building resentment, and he's, uh, just a bitterness in Esau's heart. He was guilty of having an unforgiving heart. And that developed into bitterness. And Esau's bitterness not only poisoned him, but it poisoned generations of sons and daughters after him. 
You know, some of you might have grown up in homes where there's been long-standing battles and disagreements between families or in neighborhood, and it's like, oh, we don't like those people over there. Why not? Because they're just bad people. We don't talk to those people over there. They're on the wrong side of the tracks. We just stay on our side, and we just talk to our kind. We just hang out with our people. We don't spread the love over there. They're our enemies. But in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, we read this. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. And you see, the problem with a bitter heart is that it not only poisons you, but it poisons everyone that comes in contact with you. That bitterness spreads. And bitterness brings you under condemnation. You feel judged. You feel condemned. And because of that, you're always in a position to have to either avenge or defend yourself. When you have a bitter heart, you're hypersensitive. You're easily offended. Someone looks at you and says, what are you looking at? When they say that to me, I just say, I'm looking at someone that looks just like me. Really handsome, good looking, strong, fit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when you have bitterness in your heart, you're easily offended. You're sensitized. Anything anyone says, it, it just hits you. But it also blinds you to the truth. Look at Esau. Was it Jacob's fault that Esau sold his birthright? No. Jacob was just bringing in soup. Esau made the decision to sell it. And he sold it because he didn't value it. He didn't value it. Because if he valued it, he wouldn't have sold it. And it makes you wonder, because he didn't value his birthright, if he really valued his father's blessing. If he's willing to sell his birthright, does he really value what his father, how his father is going to bless him? And I believe that Esau didn't value his father's blessing. He didn't care. Jacob cared, and he connived to get it. He wanted it. And he got the blessing. And when Esau heard that the bless, what the blessing was and he understood the consequences of his decision and the finality of this decision, that's when he became offended. He wasn't in there trying to push in for it. He wasn't desiring it. He just didn't like the fact that his brother got it before he did. And so he came in, Do you have, don't you have something for me too? Esau didn't value what he had, and that's why he lost it, and that's the truth. But his bitterness kept him from seeing the truth. The bitterness of his heart kept him to see, from seeing the reality of the situation. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 30-32, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as, Christ, uh, as God in Christ forgave you. We are to forgive because we have been forgiven. We are to forgive much because we have been forgiven much. And if you're carrying unforgiveness in your heart, if you're struggling with bitterness, you need to release it to the Lord. You need to give it to the Lord and let Him deal with it. You need to release the people that have offended you to the Lord and let Him deal with them. 
there's a, a definition for forgiveness that a friend of mine recently shared with me, and I, I really, uh, really like it. And so I want to share it with you because it's been very helpful even in my own life. And he said that when you forgive, to forgive means that you are releasing to God the right to judge. That's what you're doing. You're releasing to God the right to judge. And you're saying, God, you judge this person. You do whatever you desire to do. I'm going to release, the, I'm going to release it all to you. And if you want to bless them, you bless them. If you want them to face the consequences, hallelujah. No. Uh, if you want them to face the consequences, then let them face the consequences. But I'm going to give you the right to judge. Because here's the thing. You and I, we don't know everything. We don't have all the facts. We don't know where people are at. We don't know what's going on in their hearts. We don't know their background. We don't know what leads them to do the things they do. And so for us to judge, we don't have all the information to be able to judge. I don't know about you, but I would want someone before they judge me to come and, and learn everything about me before they judge me. I want them to know me so that they don't misjudge me, right? But how often do we misjudge one another and we don't really know all the facts and we pass judgment, you see? But when you forgive, you give all of that back to God. God, I'm going to release to you the right to judge. You judge them how you see fit. I'm going to give it all over to you. And you know what? I've been able to do that. And what's interesting is that I've watched God do things that I never thought he would do. I've watched God work in areas that I never thought he would be able to work by doing that. And it can happen in your life too. As you release to God, God, you judge. You judge. And I'm just going to watch you work in this situation. And he'll do it. He'll do it. It's not our place to avenge ourselves. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance is mine. Now, you can try to get your own revenge. And God will let you handle it. And when you get yourself in a mess, he'll just be standing off to the side, letting you get yourself into a mess. And when you're tired, you know, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you're ready to turn from the Lord, to turn back to the Lord, then he'll look at you and say, oh, finally. Now let me handle it and watch what I will do. And he'll do it. The fourth enemy of the heart is found in the nation of Philistia. And we see in verse 15 it says, Thus says the Lord God, Because the Philistines dealt vengefully and took vengeance with a spiteful heart to destroy because of the old hatred, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the remnant of the sea coast. Now, something we need to consider here is that God gave the land of Canaan to Israel and part of the land included the land where the Philistines lived. And the conflict between the Philistines and the Jews went all the way back to Joshua because Joshua told, uh, God told Joshua to go in and drive the Philistines out of the land. He said, go in and take the land. And so the Philistines were upset. They weren't willing to accept God's will for the land. That's the reality of it. It's the same today. When you look at the Middle East, the Arabs aren't willing to accept God's will for the land. God gave it to the nation of Israel. And so the Philistines were not a, a willing to accept this. And they were guilty of having an unyielding heart. They were unwilling to yield their heart. And because of that, they were unwilling to surrender to God's will. And as God's people, we are to live according to God's will. We are to live according to the will of God. Paul said to the believer in Ephesians 5.17, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We are to understand. God said concerning himself that he will accomplish his will. 
In Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient uh, th times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God's will will be done. And so the best place for me to be is in the center of his will for my life. To be surrendered to whatever the Lord wants to do. Lord, I, I am your servant. I belong to you. And I will serve you however you see fit. I'm surrendered. That's the best place for me to be. Because I can't say like God that I know the end from the beginning. Can you? You know, I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now, let alone what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know. And so I can't trust everything that I know about life. I have to trust the Lord. But God does know the end from the beginning, and that's why I need to trust him. By the way, that's what separates God. That's one of the characteristics of God, that he knows the end from the beginning. The devil does not know the end from the beginning. I've heard people as they're studying biblical prophecy, they're like, doesn't the devil know what's going to happen? No, he doesn't. He is a created being, right? Which means as a created being, he exists within time and space. All created beings do. God is the only being that does not exist within time and space. He exists outside of time and space. How do I know that? Because God created time, right? He created the sun and the moon. And he created the, 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 you know, the, that thing that happens between the sun and the moon. <laughs> you know, he created all of that. So he exists outside of time and space. So when he looks at time, he looks at it, he sees the end from the beginning. And, and he knows everything that's going to happen. And so when he says to you and I, this is what's going to happen, it's not, he's not guessing. He's not hoping. He's telling you what is. Because he's declaring it as if it has already happened because to him it already has. Now, if you think too much on this, it'll hurt your brain. It's okay. You know, it's, a, it's one of those mind-blowing experiences. You know? But that's what separates God and makes him God. Nothing, no one else, no other person can do that. No demon, Satan can't do that. So when people come up to you and they try to threaten you, ah, oh, the devil's going to do this to you, pfft, don't even listen to it. That's just a dream because what God says is going to happen. That's why God says, let God be true and every man a liar. Only what God says is going to happen. Nothing else. You can take that to the bank. It's impossible for me to fully understand the circumstances that surround my life because I don't see everything, but God sees everything. Now, in a room this size, there's going to be some here, and you're fighting... God's will for your life. You're fighting his will. And I know how you feel. Because I fought his will for years. I, I didn't like the direction that God was taking my life. You know, my wife and I had a, a, a Bible study. And, and in our Bible study, there was all these broken people that were coming to our Bible study. We had... One lady had multiple personality disorder. Now it's called something else. Um, we had people that were struggling with drug addiction. We had uh, just a lot of like a lot of single people, and and uh, we had people that were you know sometimes they were living in their car. I mean, we, it was just a, a motley crew of people, you know. And and in my heart, I was always praying, Lord, I want that I want that Bible study with people that own their own car and. And have a nice house, you know, and just, uh, I, is that too much to ask, Lord? You know, just regular, normal people. And, and uh, but this was our, this was the group that God had given us. And we were, we were sharing the word with them. And they, we were loving them and pouring into them. And 
Then we went to a, 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 a workshop on small groups and how to be effective in small group ministry. And the first thing the guy says is, you attract the people who are most like you. <laughs> and so I came home and I told my wife, that's it, we're shutting the group down. And we shut the group down. And for 14 years, I would not teach a Bible study. I was fighting God's will for my life. I said, no, Lord, I want a normal Bible study with normal people. And so when we started the Bible study that became Calvary Chapel San Clemente, I remember we were in this living room and it's growing and it's awesome and and I'm looking around the room and here's there's a guy he owns his own business here's a person he owns his own house he's got a nice car and I'm just you know one night I'm just thanking the Lord in my heart just Lord thank you thank you for letting me have a Bible study with normal people in it and he said look again and I looked at all of their families and I looked at their kids And this one over here had a mentally ill kid. And this one over here had a kid that was struggling with addiction. And this one over here had a a kid that they were just having difficulty with. They had special needs. They had all kinds of things. Every single one of them had a kid that was represented in the first group that I had. And the Lord said, you have the same group. They just looked more cleaned up, but it's the same people. And when I saw that, I broke. It broke me because I realized that for 14 years I had run from God's call and I finally said, yes, yes, Lord, I'll do it. If this is who you've called me to love, I'm gonna love them and I'm gonna give them Jesus and I'm gonna watch you do great things in their lives. And that's what we've done and that's what, That's what became the foundation for our church. You know, you might be here tonight and you're running from the Lord. God has called you to something. And because it doesn't look as glamorous or it's not as beautiful or exciting as you think it should be, you're saying no to the Lord. Or maybe it's on the other spectrum. It's way more exciting than you ever wanted your life to be. And you're saying, Lord, I I don't want that much excitement. I remember when my my wife's uh, dad, when he was alive, um, he struggled with mental illness. And uh, he was uh, bipolar. And when he was on one of his manic highs, he came to me and he says, Holland, I've got a great plan. I have a couple Uzis. We can bolt them onto the inside of my diesel. We'll drive down to Nicaragua and we'll sell them as samples to the Sandinistas. And then we'll tell them, look, you know, they're 15 grand each. You can have these. We'll do a special, maybe give them to you for 10 grand. But, but we'll tell them we can get them more. And I says, dude, you are crazy. If we go down there, it's not, this is, I don't want to be James Bond. We're going to die. You know, they're just going to take the guns and, and, you know, and so, you know, that's too much excitement for me. Maybe you're in that place. You're like, I don't want to have that much excitement in my life. And so you're saying no to the Holy Spirit. You're saying no to the Lord in your life, you're unyielding to what he has for you. You'll never experience the peace that God has for your life until you come to the place where you just simply accept his will and surrender your life to it. When you come to that place where you finally accept God's will for your life, and you surrender to him, it's at that moment that you enter into his peace and his rest, and you experience the joy that, he, that you never knew was possible in any ministry, in any life. And I tell you what, today we are having the time of our lives, watching God set people free from drug addiction, watching God unite families together, watching God heal and restore kids that the doctor said they would never live past the age of three and four and we're celebrating their 10th birthdays. We're seeing God do miracles 
because we decided to accept his will for our lives. And that God will do the same thing for you. Stop fighting God's will for your life. And so we see four enemies of the heart that quench the work of the Spirit in our lives. An unloving heart. Some of you need to surrender to God's love. Some of you need to allow His love to mold and change your perspective. An unbelieving heart. Some of you need to just surrender your trust in Him and affirm your trust in Him. An unforgiving heart. Some of you need to forgive and give God the right to judge and do whatever He desires to do. An unyielding heart. Some of you just need to stop fighting God. Maybe you're here tonight on a whim and God has been tugging on your heart. People have been praying for you and you need to just surrender your life to Jesus tonight and stop fighting him. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. Literally, do not put out the spirit's fire in your life. And in Ephesians 4.30, he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't sadden the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. And the question that I want to ask you tonight is, have you allowed the fire of the Holy Spirit to be put out in your life because of an unloving heart? an unforgiving heart, an unbelieving heart, an unyielding heart? Have you saddened the work of God? Have you slowed it down? And the thing is, is that tonight you can unleash it. Tonight you can release it again in your life and you can experience that same fire, that same passion for Jesus by surrendering that bitterness, that unforgiveness, that hatred. Or maybe it's just surrendering the direction of your life to Jesus right here, right now. Because I guarantee you what he has for you will blow your mind. Or as Raul Reese says, it'll blow your mind, man. (laughs) But it means that you have to be willing to trust him. You have to be willing to trust him. 